Today, we've got to wrap up baptism so you're ready for the exam because then we can get baptism behind us and move forward into some good stuff like Lord's Supper and then into sanctification and off we roll. Any other questions then from anything previous or moving forward since Luke was hinting at there might be some new business? Go ahead. On the, uh, for Peeper, he commented yeah. about when dealing with other denominations, that Lutherans should not be sponsors for other denominations. He did say that, didn't he? I was curious on that. Is that just purely based upon the idea of the two unionistic, yep. or is it based upon there's a different creed, therefore a different baptism? No, it's not the creed thing. It's, it's just the unionism that's at work. Well, we'll get there. Okay, good. Anything else? Okay, so let's roll. So we're at 253. We've got to cover all of our peeper stuff today, and we've got to pick up some large catechism stuff. That won't take too long, but we can spend longer if we have it, but we'll see how, we, how it goes here. All right, so um, 253 and peeper. And peeper is, peeper is uh, the, the gem that you go to when you need to know what are the concrete bottom lines, what's, what's the, what's the ver verbiage here, what do I need to know? And peeper gives you that stuff. And this is the strength of him. This is why I would say probably he is unrivaled and nobody's replaced peeper yet. Because when most people write dogmatics, they tend to get, um, you know, thematic and they try to, you know, write different, you know, here's how to approach stuff. Even like some of you are familiar with Kolb's book, The Christian Faith. Some of you use that, you know, kind of prepping for your exams and stuff. Even that book is much more thematic because Kolb is writing kind of like, you know, if you're thinking about Jesus today, how do you kind of approach him? That's how he does it. That's not what Peeper is about. Peeper is just kind of like, line it up, knock it down. And so that's, I think, one of the strengths that he, that he has, frankly. All right, so off we go here. So he tells us, first of all, page 53, I'm just going to flip pages, and you got something you want to stop on, stick your hand up, otherwise I'm going to keep moving along. So baptism, he says, is not merely an ecclesiastical custom, but a divine ordinance enforced the last day and ordained for all nations. Now, ordinance, usually reformed language, and we kind of quail at that. What do you mean calling it an ordinance? But all he's getting at is God commanded it. Now, what he's trying to pick up on there, of course, is the, the standard definition of a sacrament. And what does we... What does it have to be? We've covered this before, but just to make it clear, what are the three things you have to have for a sacrament to be a sacrament? All right, you have to have God's command. Now we have the ordinance part. And so that's what Peeper's getting at here when he calls it an ordinance. And again, this is language we don't use very often in our circles because this is the language that the Reformed prefer. They like to call the sacraments ordinances, which highlights the fact that we're doing this stuff because we're told to, but does it really do anything? Eh, who knows? But we're told to, so I'll just do it, which is classic Calvinism. All right, so that's the first thing. What else do you have to have? What's that? Eh, that's kind of tied up in this one, actually, the Jesus doing it. What else we got? All right, we need a physical element, so there needs to be a physical element, or we might call it an element of the earth, some material aspect, okay, so that needs to be there. And you're right about the Jesus thing, Brian, you know, we can emphasize that, I'll put it, I'll put it, I'll even put him up there for you. All right, so now Jesus is there. All right, so what's the third thing we're looking for? All right, Coleman. Promise. A promise of what? Promise of grace, yes. So especially the idea of grace being delivered, forgiveness is being delivered. So these are the three criteria. And again, these three criteria come from where? Which Bible verse? Where do we get it? There is no scriptural Bible verse. We just made it up. Kind of. Let's just be honest. So where'd this come from? Augustine, Augustine yeah, all right. So Augustine is the one who comes up with this, he gives the kind of the basic formula, and then Luther owns this, and then this is his definition for a sacrament. But it's not a scriptural definition, and we don't need to play like it is. We don't need to overinflate it and act like it's more um, profoundly rooted than it is. It's just what we've come up with for a sacrament, but it's pretty universally recognized and works pretty well. So, does baptism hit all three? Clearly, God has commanded it. Element of the earth, yes, that would be water in this case. And we have a promise of grace. Yes, okay, right to be baptized for the forgiveness of your sins, okay, so we have it, and we have Titus 3, 5, the washing of regeneration, so it makes you new, gives new birth, so we have strong case for that as well. All right, so that's what he's getting at here, and then this is his typical MO, as you've gotten to know people pretty well, he lays out things, then he immediately kind of gives you some of the problems, 
that are there with it. And so we have the rejection of baptism by Quakers and the Socinians and the Salvation Army. Salvation Army will baptize under a flag sometimes, and they have things they kind of do with it. So he's saying, no, people reject it, but it's actually there, and we hold to it. All right, so that's pretty simple. So we go to 256. Now we have, we've covered the God's commanded it. What about the physical material? And it needs to be water. It needs to be water. Can we substitute something besides water because it would be really cool to use rose petals instead of just water? Wouldn't that be cool? You know, baptize you with rose petals, Brian. When the, Nor the Norwegians, the Pope said they stopped, had to stop baptizing their babies with beer. Okay, they had to stop baptizing them with beer. I've never heard of that one. So that would be a new one to me, but I wouldn't it doubt it. Sounds, it sounds more like a Czechoslovakian thing to me, but <laughs> Coleman. The, the word baptizo, the Greek, doesn't that always imply water? Or Not necessarily, it implies washing. It really implies washing. It's, the, it's, a, it's a verbal thing, so it's, it's really getting into the washing and the cleansing. That's, that's the driving thing. So baptism does not necessitate water, even though, even though today you think about washing, you usually don't think about washing with alcohol. We even call it an alcohol bath to call attention to the fact that it's weird. Um, so washing is usually with water, but it doesn't have to be only water. Now, the reason we would say it has to be water is because this would be the practice of the apostles. This is what we're given. And so we're not free to substitute other things in. So the bottom line is this. The sacrament should be done the way it was given to us. It's given to us to baptize with water, so we baptize with water. We don't substitute other things in. All right. So you don't replace water with rose petals because that would be so sentimental and special. And you don't substitute water with um, baby oil or whatever else, or perfume or whatever you can think of. No, you baptize with water. Chris. Uh, um, with that, I mean, just slightly apart from that, it's been on the same track with uh, the Eucharist and some churches that can't get wine. Uh, what would be yeah, we'll come back to that with the Lord's Supper, actually. We're going to cover that. But um, same deal holds. You don't change the, sub the elements. And wine is wine, and, and frankly, it needs to be grape wine, or I th would have questions about the sacrament's validity. Because you're messing with the elements, and you don't change the elements. And that, that's the bottom line. Okay? But we'll talk about that some more. All right. Good? So we go on forward here, then. Um, so this is bottom of page 256, footnote 7 tail into this. But Luther is right. It's about the last five lines. If you were to use for it anything else than the appointed substance or the substance named, namely water, and still pronounce the right words, I baptize the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, that would be no baptizing, but cheating and a mockery of the sacrament by one, willful, by one who willfully ignores the ordinance and command in which the substance is clearly named. So there you have this. So it needs to be done with the water the way it was intended. And if you substitute other things, we have questions coming in. Now, the thing to remember through this whole thing with the sacraments, the power of the sacrament and the point of the sacrament is the veracity of it, the tangibleness of it, the there you have itness of it. And if there's anything that challenges that, it strikes at the very point of a baptism, and that's where it becomes a problem. So you might say, well, you know, beer is about 95% water, so I think it's a 95% sure baptism. So maybe it's good. But the whole problem is, if you've got a maybe floating around, then you have just thwarted the entire purpose. You don't want maybes when it comes to the sacrament. You want, got it, no doubt, we're all cool here. And that's why you don't substitute stuff. So nothing else besides water. Now, in a pinch, you know, there's no water. It's got this, we just, you just came on a traffic accident, and there's a child lying there near death, and the parent cries, we're going to church to get baptized, and now the baby's dying. What are we going to do? And so you look around for water, and you can't find any. What are you going to do? Uh, you could probably spit on his forehead <laughs> and <laughs> baptize. Yeah, grab the beer you had in your car, yes. <laughs> We won't even go that route. No. So, but I would say, you know, these are these weird kinds of things. Water is available, guys. Can it be sterilized water? Of course. So if you're in a hospital situation and you need to baptize a newborn and you have that, that you're called upon to do that, the nurse will hand you the, the bottle of sterile water and a water and a little dropper and you drop a few drops in the forehead of the baby. You don't need to soak the kid. And you baptize in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And it's a real legit baptism because it's real water and it works. And it's the deal. So it's valid. So water's the key thing, but we don't change it. We don't substitute with other things besides water. That's the point.
All right, good. Now, also, while we're here on this whole thing about water, how you apply it really doesn't matter. And this is kind of significant. Peeper has just kind of a little passing phrase. How you put it on doesn't matter. Immersion, pouring, sprinkling, it's all good. And he kind of zips past this really quickly. Um, and then you have the footnote 8, though, which is probably the most, one of the more helpful footnotes in here. And because you're going to be faced with this one quite a bit. Because some of your most cantankerous people who are going to be in your adult Bible classes are going to be people coming in from a Baptist kind of background who are really hung up on their sacraments. And you're going to have big discussions. And in fact, in my years of experience teaching in the parish and continuing to teach in the parish, if you ever want to have a lively discussion in Bible class, just bring up baptism. And it just it never fails yet. You know, you just start teaching about baptism, people are like, no, oh, no, wait a minute. And they're just all over the place on this stuff because they don't have their fundamentals down pat. And they just continually are thrown off by this whole thing. How can you, why do we baptize babies? And why do we immerse? And what's going on? And you know, what's, how come they do it this way? Now, so here's the thing. The, the Baptists, of course, make a huge deal out of how you do it. You've got to immerse, you've got to be fully under three times, and you have to go back over, head back for some reason, you know, so you get the water up your nose kind of thing, whatever, I don't know. But, you know, they, it's all the big, big harangue, dramatic thing, you know, and you've got to do it right or it's not a baptism. Um, Peeper's right, it doesn't matter how you apply the water. It doesn't matter. It, it just You're putting water on. But now the footnote 8 kicks in. And you know how we have here, we have this is from Luke 3, 1138. Pharisee was astonished. Jesus did not first baptizo, baptizo, baptize himself before eating. They don't wash himself. And then we have Mark 7, 3 where we read, For the Pharisees and all the Jews, except they wash their hands, oft they baptize, they, they eat not. Okay. And then the, here it is added that the Jews practice the baptizing of cups, pots, brass and vessels, and tables. Now, that's an awesome text for us. Mark just kind of throws it in as a little explanation for his Gentile readers who don't know anything about Jews washing everything in sight. And so he's trying to explain to them, the Jews are washing everything all the time, hands, pots, pans, and tables. But the key is, the word he uses for washing is baptizo, and he's talking about washing tables. So does that mean they're immersing tables? Yeah. Right, of course, Jesse. So, time to wash the table. Haul it down to the river, son. All right. Come on. Come on. You're just washing the table. Now, it usually meant plenty of water. Things are getting wet. You're slopping stuff around. But it's just, it's just washing. And how you do it doesn't matter. Um, so, I think that's important to recognize. It's also, I'm just kind of pushing this a little bit further. I want to point out a few more things. In the Middle Ages, it's quite true that they immersed people who got baptized. And that was babies. So when you go to the great cathedrals of, of Europe, you see these baptistries that are pretty good sized tubs, you know, a couple feet deep. But it'd be pretty hard to get a human, uh, an adult dunked underneath there. But a baby, no problem. And that's what they do. They would immerse babies. And I have been told, though I've never yet tried it, that if you immerse a child a couple months old, they hold their breath because of their well-practiced being in utero. And I'm told, you just blow on their face and stick them under and they will hold their breath. Like I said, I never tried it. Feel free to re do it and report back to me. All right, those of you who have little ones at home, you can let me know. Just don't tell your wife you're trying. Um, Chris. So what would make then, uh, what would uh, maybe a Baptist or a Reformed person argue for immersion? What would be All right, so what they're going to say is, baptize means immerse. And they, they're ignoring this clear text. And then their biggest one is usually, now, what was the example of Jesus? Jesus got baptized in the Jordan River. So clearly he was dunked. But here's the fascinating thing. If you even go to the text about Jesus' baptism, it doesn't say he was dunked. It says John was baptizing in the Jordan River. Why would he baptize in the Jordan River? He needs water. Is there water available in the river? Yep, got plenty of that. So that's cool. And uh, <clears throat> here's also what's helpful. Some of you have been to the Holy Land. I have not. <clears throat> but Jordan River is not much of a river much of the time. Some of you know this. It amounts to more of a creek a lot of the times. So like a good creek, about how deep is this thing? You know, two, three feet. Sometimes a little higher. You know, in flood stage it gets going pretty good. But a lot of times it's not very deep. So <clears throat> in fact, it's running probably knee deep a lot of the time. And there's some movies that have picked up on this. One of my favorite Jesus movies, this is a really old one now, is Jesus of Nazareth. You know, that long series. Some of you have watched it. It's got some great scenes, because the director of that was Franco Zeffirelli, who was a really staunch Roman Catholic, and um, he just nails so many things in that movie. Um, the Raising of Lazarus still gives me goosebumps. I just love that scene. You know, Jesus is a little dramatic. He's got his, he's putting his arms up in a semaphore signal, you know, but man, just the way he, the cinematography is 
awesome. And then the other, my other favorite, all-time favorite scene in that movie, I just watched it the other day just for the fun of it, is um, the, healing, the healing of blind Bartimaeus. You guys ever seen this? So he's blind, blind, and is getting the mud smeared on his eyes. And the guy's yelling, oh, you're hurting me. Stop, stop, stop. And, you know, take him, to the, take him to the pool. Take him to the pool of Siloam. So they all haul him off into the temple. You know, they're making a big scene and they dunk his, you know, get him down there. And he starts washing, you know. And then here's the coolest thing. He, the shot goes to the, the eyes of the blind man. And you see the water kind of sparkling. And then he looks up and he sees everything. And the best part is the guy goes, you know, I see I see you, I see you, I see you. And the coolest part that Zeffirelli just got so right is he has everybody just back off, back off from him. And then the man who was healed is just all alone in this opened up circle because the miracle has happened and nobody wants to be too close because it's like, whoa. And they just back off from the holiness of it all. It's so right. But anyway, now back to the Jordan. <clears throat> what Zeffirelli has is the John the Baptist scene. Instead of so John's baptizing away out there in the river, and he's got people lined up. But how is he doing it? He's standing in water, about ankle deep, knee deep, and people come down. They kneel in front of him. He bends down, gets a big handful of water, and he says, "I baptize you. Go and." Sin no more and be right. And it's like, yes! And you just know Baptists everywhere are just screaming, <laughs> no! No! But it's, it's, it's right. And see, even the text tells us that when Jesus came up out of the water, the Holy Spirit came on him. Well, what's it mean to come up out of the water? Does it mean, oh, John pulled me up? Or does it mean you just wade back onto shore? So which one? See, the text is not explicit. See, it says, come up out of the water. Right. When I'm waiting in the water and I come back up on the shore, what did I do? Oh, yeah, you came up out of the water, didn't you? Yeah, that's what I did. Huh. How about that? Josh. Why are they so hung up on doing it right? This is a great question. And this is the last thing I wanted to point out about the Baptist. And it's so, and this, I have to be careful here because um, I'm on tape now. Um, <laughs> I, years ago, some of you will watch my old um, S80 class, you know, Introduction to Lutheran Theology, where I kind of crank through everything. I made that first video series being told, um, this is just for in-house use. Okay, cool. So I just did it. And then now it's posted and people watch it. And I get every once in a while, I still get an angry email. You said that Baptists were idiots. Yeah, I guess I did. You know? <laughs> Oops. <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, but it annoys the heck out of me because it's so, so, so bizarre because what is baptism for them? It's an action that I do to show how sincere and proven I am in my faith. There's no grace going on. It's not a means of grace. It's not God doing anything. It's just me doing something. And yet, who's got all the rules about how it's got to be done? They are. It's so strange. They just pile up all these rules. Got to be immersion. Got to be when you're age of accountability. Got to be this. Got to be that. All these rules. And then what do you get? Nothing. And then we say, this is God's profound choosing of you. How do you do it? Doesn't matter. How old do you have to be? Doesn't matter. God just gives grace. See, it's so cool. This is what grace does to you. It just turns you loose to revel in it. And the law just makes you hung up and pinheaded. There, I did say that. All right. <clears throat> I didn't say idiot this time, though. All right. Good. So, that's the material, and that also gets down to the way of baptizing. Now, if you have an adult who really is eager to get baptized and says, you know, this immersion thing really kind of excites me. The symbolism's awesome. Well, it is. And Romans 6 screams the symbolism. We've been buried with baptism into death so that we can be raised to a new life. As Paul thinking about burying and coming up, this going on, no doubt. And that's powerful imagery. And so, you know, you can't knock the imagery. So, you know, an adult who wants to get baptized and wants to get immersed, I, I wouldn't say, no, we can't, you know, we refuse to do it. But you also need to educate them. It's not a better baptism, not more significant. I know, but wouldn't it wouldn't be awesome, and I think it would be really cool imagery, and I want to live that symbol. You know, okay, fine. So then you um, go to the local Y and, you know, go to the whirlpool and enjoy yourself, you know, and do a baptism, I guess. All right. So how you do it doesn't matter. I would also add this, though. Don't be too delicate about it. You know, you know these people with their little silver shell, you know, drip, 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 you know, I baptize you, drip, drip, drip. You know, come on, make sure people know there's water going on. You want to hear the water, see it, feel it, get things wet, make the elders come out and mop the floor when you're done. You know, get the water going and let people know what baptism has happened. To go with the, the film illustration <coughs> of the guy, people backing off in circles. Yeah. Should we not do that at baptism as well? How's that? 
Well, I mean, the miraculous that's happening right yeah, now. Yeah, to emphasize this and teach this, it needs to be taught a lot more, the miracle of it, the sheer wonder of it. And yet it's the ordinary stuff. Here it is, God's just doing his thing. And it seems so simple, but man, this is just so profound. And this is part of the reason why, you know, a real baptism, you follow the liturgy, takes a while. People say, oh, it's just too much junk, too much junk there. Yeah, but see, how profound is this? And things that set it off are important. And what you want your people to recognize is, here, another miracle has happened. And use that kind of verbiage. Talk this way. God has just done a crazy thing. He's just taken a dead person and made him spiritually alive. That's what's happened here. And every baptism is a chance to educate and take it. Educate your people. Educate those people who are sitting there in the pews thinking, and you know, what's the big deal? Here's the big deal. And so then you educate people about, this is the child who was born in sin, lost apart from Christ, who's being claimed by Christ today. And you see you get a chance to educate the parents who are thinking about, when should I get my kid baptized? And you take every, make, make every baptism an educational experience. I think that's exactly the right thing to do. All right, good. So what is it makes baptism a sacrament? Water, word, promise of Christ. Okay, we got that. Good. Um, he has this little aside. What about the problem of getting baptized in the name of Jesus? And rather than in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And what's Peter's solution to that problem? This is a pretty simple answer. How do we handle it? Chris? Because it encompasses all of the Trinity. Yeah. If you baptize in the name of Jesus, well, who's Jesus? He's the second person of the Trinity, and to baptize him in Christ's authority is to baptize in the authority of the whole Godhead. And so to baptize in the name of Jesus, to baptize in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, there's no difference. It's all good. So, is it okay if we have a baptism to baptize? Today I baptize you in the name of Jesus. Amen. Done. Is it a real live baptism? Yes. Should you do that? Why not? Because he doesn't say so. That's part of the issue. There's a bigger issue, frankly. Well, no, I was going with the command. The formula given is Matthew 20. Matthew 28, I think, is the kind of the classic formula. But we're also told, you know, they're baptizing in the name of Jesus. And in the book of Acts, the apostles are doing this. So why don't we do this? And I, I would agree with you. You're right. We shouldn't. But I don't think, it's, I wouldn't get just hung up on the Matthew 28 thing. Kyle. Yeah, that's what I'm really going for here. See, this gets back to my driving thing to start with. What you're looking for in the sacrament, always, 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 is certainty and assurance. Remember, these things are not about checking boxes to make sure we did it right. The point is the comfort that comes. You want people to be able to look at that baptism and say, there's my stake. There's no question about it. And if somebody says, yeah, I was at your baptism when you were a kid. You got baptized in the name of Jesus, dude. And then the kid says, no, wait a minute. I thought it says in the Bible, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, maybe it's not a good baptism. You, you have just given the possibility for doubt to creep in. And the last thing you want with a sacrament is there any room for doubt. So this is, the whole point is sacraments are to be doubt busters, okay, to put it that way. That's the whole point. And so don't mess with it. Don't be innovative and creative. Could you baptize in the name of the Creator, in the name of the Redeemer, and in the name of the Sanctifier? Amen. Would that be a legit baptism? Yes, it would. It would. Because those signifiers are pointing to the same signified. Remember your remember hermeneutics? Oh, you loved that. All right? So your signifiers are pointing to the same signified. You have this label pointing to the thing that is. So is creator, redeemer, sanctifier pointing to Father, Son, Holy Spirit? Yeah, it is. This is a legit baptism. Is it a wise thing to do? No. For the same reason as this. Don't monkey with the formula. Don't create doubt. Don't tamper with it. So in other words, you could, but you won't. You, you tracking with me on this? <laughs> Sacraments are not a place for innovation. They're not a place to mess around. Mess around in the sermon. That's where you innovate. And that's where you can have fun playing around with the way you present things. But you don't mess around with sacraments. Do it straight up. You can do all the stuff you want packaging around it. You know, you can create some new bells and whistles there if you want to. But when it comes time for the actual application of water with the word, use what you've been given. Don't mess with it. Everybody tracking with me here? All right. Yes. That being Luke. said, if you have someone come to you and they say, well, I wasn't, named, I wasn't baptized that way. I was baptized, you know, creator, redeemer, sanctifier, something like that. Yeah. And they are showing doubts that their baptism was yeah. valid. Would you rebaptize them? All right. Them? So this goes back to the same. This is the guiding thing. You start with education. And you say, in fact, your baptism was valid and real, and here's why. Because God is at work and God has promised. And you can be sure of this. And if your exhortation con convinces them and they will leave saying, awesome, thanks, Pastor, I feel a whole lot better, 
you're done. If they come back to you in three weeks and say, yeah, man, I'm still really troubled by this, really starting to kind of freak out about this, then at some point you probably say, all right, let's do it. We'll do it by the book and you crank right through LSB, there's not, not one thing left out, and you baptize in the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and you give them that assurance, yes. And is that unnecessary? Yeah, but for the sake of the assurance, I would say, right. But don't do it until you've given a good shot at the education first and bring them to where they should be. And I wouldn't also make a big deal about this congregation-wide. I would, I would probably treat it like a, a kind of a private baptism for the sake of his... His, his assurance. Because the other side of this is you don't want people second guessing the validity of their baptisms and tracing back, now how was mine done? This creates the other side of the problem, which is again, doubts and lack of assurance. And you don't want to do that. Okay? See you with me on that? All right. So on we go then. <coughs> oh, I'm good, 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 good. <coughs> So, page 262, um, middle of the page, in such cases we did not accept their baptism as Christian. The Orthodox form is not understand. Oh, okay, this is that whole thing on um, what about a Unitarian baptism? And this tripped you up on the, on the quiz a lot of you because you were not kind of thinking it through. Because Peeper says this. This is page 262. So, if I am in a Baptist church getting baptized in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, is it a valid baptism? Even though they think it's a law action. Yeah, it is. If I'm in a Catholic church and I get baptized in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, is it a real baptism? Yeah. So now what if I go to a Unitarian church? All right? And so you've got a couple who's got a baby at the Unitarian church, and they're, they're in the middle of this cool, hip church. And Unitarian pastor says, hey, what a cute baby. And they say, yeah, you know, we were raised in a tradition that baptized babies, and our parents really want this kid baptized. Would you do a baptism for us? What's the Unitarian pastor going to say? Sure. sure. Whatever you like, dude. I am here to make you happy. I'm seriously, this is exactly what they would do. So can you imagine? Now, of course they would. Okay, is it possible the Unitarian pastor would schedule a baptism right in the middle of their service and they baptize and here, now use these words, here's the formula. Sure, makes you feel good. I'm all on, I'm all in. Father, Son, Holy Spirit, no, you know, would, no, would, you know sure, right, you know, you know, wink, wink, nudge, nudge, you know, sure, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. So they do the baptism. So is it a valid baptism? Now, Peeper says no. Peter says, no. And here's the key. This is why you have to get past the, hang, the, the superficial stuff and go to the real deal. Now we'll go back, back to hermeneutics again. It's a distinction between the signifiers and the signified. So the signifiers are there. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. But what are they aiming at in that context? They're aiming at who knows what. Something made up thing. It's a, it's a farce. They're not confessing Christ in that place. Now, track with me for a minute. No hands for a little bit because I've got to run with you through a few scenarios here so you can get this whole thing figured out. The key is, what is the confession of that place? This is what kind of matters because the confession of that place brings the definition to the words, which does matter. It's not like the words then bring validity, but the words are important because are you baptizing in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit or in the name of some false idol? If you're baptizing in the name of an idol, it's not a real baptism. And if you are using words like Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, but you do not confess Christ in that anti-Trinitarian, Unitarian hellhole, then you are not doing a real baptism. You are misleading and deceiving. In fact, you are mocking the baptism. It's not a real baptism. Now, however, suppose I'm in a church and I've got a pastor who's an apostate and he doesn't believe in Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, but he's doing a baptism in that congregation and he baptizes in the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Is that a valid baptism? Yes. Why? The place. the place brings the definition to the words. Exactly. So in spite of his falsehood, the place is confessing rightly, and it brings the definition. So the confession of the place does matter. Jeff. Last time you seemed to say that the confession of the place and the faith of those present didn't matter. It that doesn't. It, the, the faith is being given to the child, and right. there's nothing to do with people who are bringing it. Or That's like, right. That this is why I'm trying to be really careful on this. So now we've got to keep straight here. Validity versus benefit. And I said that the key is benefit is all about faith. And validity is all about the promise. 
Okay? So the promise is the promise. The question here, and this is a nuanced thing, the question here is not that my faith is making it real. The question is, what, am I, what is my faith actually in? What are my words pointing to? And that's why I'm saying this is an issue of hermeneutics. And so it's not a question of, okay, this congregation's confession of the Holy Spirit is what makes this baptism have power. No, it's not. It's this congregation's confession of God's promise, and they're pointing to that promise. The words mean what they're pointing at. That's what gives it validity. They even went so far in the early church to suggest that if an if a actor was baptized during a play in a mockery of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, but they were baptizing the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, thinking they were aiming at Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, it would be a valid baptism. And see, the reason why we discount the, the Unitarian baptism is because they're not aiming, in their words, at Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. The words are empty of what they mean. And I know this gets nuanced and don't get too hung up on it, but the key is recognizing the important thing is the validity is all about the promise which is based on the word that has been given. And then the word, it's not just the vocables. So for example, if I get baptized in nomine patre, et filiae, et spiritus sancti, is that a valid baptism? Yeah. Latin counts too. So in other words, the signifiers don't matter. What matters is the signified. Okay? And the point is, in the Unitarian Church, the signified is not Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Right. What would we say for like uh, Mormons then? They Mormons, no, no chance. No chance. Because they're denying the Trinity. Jesus is just a dude. So there's no baptism there. J.W. is the same thing. I don't think they even do them. So no baptism. Yep. What about with the Lord's Supper, with places where they do not confess that it's... Right, and we'll get to this with the Lord's Supper in its own right. But this becomes to become one of the issues of, so if I'm in a Reformed s tradition where I think this is just a symbol pointing to nothing, um, or maybe pointing to reality, but it's just a symbol, do they even have a sacrament? My opinion is no, which is probably better for them, honestly. So, no sacrament. So, so if I... It's a nice so, ritual. So, There's no sacrament. So, so... So only oh, oh, that. So then only what, people who confess the real presence then that, have yeah. a monopoly on the sacraments. Then. Well, of course. It's not, not, it's not monopoly. It's just where the gift is present. And frankly, that's the majority of Christendom. Because Rome's on our side on this one. I don't know, it just seems to make it something that's like inside. Uh -uh, uh -uh, uh -uh. Rather than using the no, words themselves. it's a matter of our, it, it's all about this. It's all about the promise and the word. And we'll, do, we'll hit the Lord's Supper more on this. So in other words, my confidence in the, pro, the, do I really believe it's the real presence, isn't what makes it happen. But if I think that, these, that this bread and wine is nothing more than an empty symbol, then I have actually gutted what Jesus says about it. And so it's not the promise anymore. I'm not making it happen, but the promise is no longer there. And we'll hit this again with the Lord's Supper more. Josh. Why does what you just said not apply to baptism? For the people who believe baptism is just a symbol, why do they still gain the Because they say Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. See, it gets down to what do the words point at. So when I say, take eat, this is my body, is that, is that bread actually the body of Christ? What I'm saying is going on. But if I'm in a not anti-sacramental church, a sacramentarian church, where they say, this is my body. You know, wink, wink. We all know this means symbol. And some even have the guts to say that. This symbolizes my body. So what am I holding up? Crummy piece of bread. Is it the sacrament? Nope. It's not. See, and what I'm trying to get across here is, it's not about magic words. It's about trusting the promise and about using the words the way Christ has given them to us. Is, it, is the promise being the center or not? And if it's, and it's not a formulaic magic words kind of thing. It's about the promise being the center. All right, Alex. Um, what if they say, uh, I had seen a consecration <laughs> done in a Methodist church and he said, this is whatever you want it to be. Yeah. So he said, you know, they did the words, they went through the consecration, they said, if you believe it, then just it is whatever you want. Yeah, I would say you have no business commuting there for one thing. And then the, the, sure. <laughs> and then the, the, the deeper level, though, is, so is this really a sacrament? No, I don't think it is, because the confession is not there to support that. Yeah, Chris. Um, my field work pastor ran into a situation one time where he had a new member, and she didn't remember. She came out of the Roman Catholic tradition, but she yeah. had no idea if she was actually baptized. Right. Yeah, so this we're going to 263. 
bottom of the page or bottom of the section, all uncertain baptisms, however, must be held to be invalid. In the nature of the case, any uncertainty as to the fact that my baptism makes it its consolatory use impossible for me. So this is my whole point, a certainty. So if you have somebody who says, I don't know if I was baptized, my mom thinks I was, then what should you do? You baptize. Absolutely, no question. And if they can't dig up the baptismal record, I've had people like this. You know, I, my, my mom told me I was baptized, but it turns out it's my brothers who were baptized. She never got around to baptizing me. And this happens. So then what do you do? You baptize. Or she thinks we were baptized, but we can't find a certificate anywhere. So what do you do? You baptize. Because you want to give people that certainty. You, there's no, there should be no doubt. You don't want to leave them wondering on the, on the margins. All right. Cool? Good? All right. So now, before we go on forward, so the, in the, let's go back to Jesus and his baptism. So Jesus is baptized in the Jordan. Water is applied. How? doesn't really matter. Now, is Jesus' baptism then normative for our baptism? We hit this already. No. His baptism is very different. In fact, I would say he's being baptized so that all righteousness can be fulfilled. He's simply doing what the Father wants him to do. So, does Jesus' baptism have any significance for us in our baptisms at all? Well, not a lot. But the one thing we can say is this. If Christ is receiving the Holy Spirit in the Jordan, is that significant for our understanding of the work of the Spirit? It can be, because he receives the Spirit so that he can give the Spirit. And see, this gets back to our filioque kind of stuff a little bit. So the Spirit comes on Christ in power, so Christ now has the Spirit, and so now he gives his Spirit as he desires. So while baptism is not necessary for Jesus to be the Christ, even though Christologically there's a lot going on there with the whole idea of um, this is his anointing, that's kind of cool, but even from a pneumatological standpoint, what the Spirit's work, we can think also about how Christ's baptism fills him and empowers him and equips him so he can carry out his mission and the Spirit then is involved in the whole mission of Christ and then Christ gives the Spirit to whom he will because he has the Spirit to give and the baptism cinches that for us. So that's, that's kind of significant as well. All right, good. So now we move on. So is baptism a real deal means of grace? Yes, we have an axiom here on page 263 under section 4, about, eight line, about six lines in. Baptism is not a work that we offer to God, but one that God does to us. Exactly. Bingo. This is, this is the huge divide between us and just basically all the Anabaptists and all their traditions in the U.S. Keep in mind, Anabaptism is a, an anomaly. Okay? It's an anomaly. It's not the norm. We live in an American context where evangelicals are around us and they've been just infiltrated by this Anabaptist thinking. So we encounter this a lot. It invades non-denominationals and Baptist churches. And a lot of people that we consider to be conservative, solid Christians tend to be of this kind of anti-infant baptism stuff. But they are an odd odd sort of people. They're not the norm at all. So you need to keep this in mind. And it's good to bear, kind of bear this in mind that they're the ones who are doing something strange. The church has always understood baptism applying for everybody because this is God's action, not my action up. Brian. Uh, it's either in the August Book of Confession where Peter says it, saying, well, if you need it, if the Anabaptists are right, then what do you say about like all of church in the whole of history? Because they you know, they, they were Correct. never baptized twice or anything like that. So what do you say about them? Or the people in the Middle Ages who were only baptized as kids? Right. Yeah, I mean, you can make some great example, great arguments here against this. That's right. All right. And then Pieper also mentioned somewhere in his text, right, that why is it that we um, don't baptize by immersing? And this was one of my quiz questions. It's a footnote somewhere that Walter buries. Why does he say we do it? as a testimony against the Baptists. Now, here's what Walter's up to. In other words, he's suggesting that, so back to my analogy, my illustration of, so should you baptize the adult who wants to be immersed? And my, I'm, I'm kind of easy on this, because I don't think people in your congregation will think, oh, so the Baptists are right after all. People aren't going to think that. They might just think that, you know, Frank's kind of, kind of funny that way. He thought it would be kind of cool to be immersed, whatever. Um, but in Walter's day, it was a little more of a concern. And Walter is suggesting that, in fact, we should baptize only by pouring or sprinkling simply to prove to the Baptists that we don't have to immerse. And this becomes an, a principle for Adiaphora, frankly, that you should have covered back in Confessions 2. That Adiaphora is fine when it's, nobody cares. But if somebody starts making a rule out of Adiaphora one way or the other, then it's not adiaphora anymore, because now it becomes an issue of truth. And so if somebody says, you have to immerse, then we say, no, you don't, and we won't. 
<laughs> and that's exactly what's going on there. And you might think that's kind of petty and silly, but it's, you could also make the argument that, no, this is a, 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 we're arguing for the truth and for the freedom of what God is actually doing, and we don't want people to get hung up on the wrong things. And the way you're doing it is not the right thing. The right thing to do is get hung up on the promise of God. And so that's the, that's the point here. So we might do the same thing here. If somebody says, you have to use red wine or it's not a sacrament, then what would we all start doing? Yeah, using white wine. Just prove, no, you're wrong. Quit making rules. Yeah. <laughs> If, I might be going backwards. if the baptism was considered invalid or there was doubting about the baptism or it didn't happen, the uncertainty of it, does that invalidate any of the Lord's, any of the Lord's suppers that you one had participated in at that point? The Lord's suppers, so tie them together for me. So a, a person believes that they are baptized when they were young and they attend, attend the church and then all of a sudden they start doubting their baptism and they go back and they check and it was... Oh, it was a goofy baptism. It wasn't really even a baptism. Yes, but they've already... Oh, they've been, been communing all along, though. Yes. And so you're, you're concerned about the fact he has to be baptized before you can commune. Okay. And I would say, yes, ordinarily baptism precedes the Lord's Supper, but it's not an absolute requirement in my book. Because see, baptism is the entrance into the faith, which is why it always comes first. But a person who knows what's going on in the sacrament, for some reason, has been misinformed. This is not calling to question any of those Lord's suppers. And I would say, was he eating and drinking wrongly? No, I don't think so. In his, in his ignorance, he wasn't actually fully baptized. But is he fully a member of the body of Christ and rightly communing? Yes, I would argue he is. Yeah, Brian. And don't we say in, in most cases for adults, they already have faith uh, when, they're, when they're baptized? Well, they're, correct. Yeah, because they're, because they're correct. We're addressing the, their head that's got to be dealt with. Right. Okay, good. Off we go. 265 then. So on the facing page 64, people reminds us that the sacrament is basically nothing more than a visible word, which is a nice way to put this. So this is the word made visible, and it's real and tangible, which is a kind of a cool thought. But now don't forget what Sausage gives us. And what also Prentor talks to emphasize is not only is this a visible word, but we can also talk about how the word has a sacramental element. So it cuts both directions. So we're not trying to privilege the word necessarily, but we also have a sacramental word, which is also kind of a cool thought. So there's something cool about the sacraments, which even eclipse the word, and that's that kind of tangibleness to it, the visibleness, which is important, not to be downplayed. But we're not trying to privilege one or the other. They're both there. All right, then we have this great Latin phrase on 265, which we encountered already in Systems 2. It's the last full paragraph on 265. And uh, starting with point two, Rome does not permit the lapsed to return to the grace of baptism, but refers them to the second plank. And this is exactly what it was called. I think Jerome named it this, the Roman sacrament of penance. And so you have to have contritio cordis, confessio oris, and satisfactio operis. Um, you know, contrition in your heart, confession with your mouth, and satisfaction of works. All this serves to keep alive the monstrum in certitudinis catiae. Awesome phrase, which means the monster of the uncertain grace. And what that means is, you're left always on tender hooks. Where do I stand? Am I in? I don't know. And what Luther is arguing is, that's exactly where Rome wants to keep you. Because as long as you're left kind of wondering, you are never sure, and you're always trying to make sure you're on track, and that creates problems. Now, underneath all of this is a strong understanding of how grace works in, this, in the Roman Catholic Church. So in Rome, baptism brings you in and forgives all sins committed before baptism, which is why in the Middle Ages they actually had the practice of postponing baptism. You've heard the stories, right? So when did Charlemagne get baptized? Just before he died, on his deathbed, okay? I think so, maybe it was a little sooner, but this was, I think, I think this is deathbed of Charlemagne. You can double check me on that. But this was pretty common that you would put, postpone baptism until your deathbed. Now the risky part is, maybe you don't know your death is coming. You know? and if you die suddenly, you're in a really bad spot. So it's kind of a tricky thing. But the idea is, baptism covers all sins previous. Cool, so I'll just postpone it. Then what, so if I get baptized and then I mess up, well now what? The, then the analogy is, so baptism is your ship that's going to carry you to salvation. And if you sin grievously, you've just sunk your ship. Now what do you do? Well, now you look around and you grab a piece of flotsam and hang on. And that's the second plank. It's a piece of timber floating by, and that's called the Sacrament of Penance. And they go down every once in a while, so you have to get a new one and a new one and a new one. And every time you go to the Sacrament of Penance, you're making up for it, and you're 
plugging along, and this creates the uncertainty. Am I ever forgiven enough? I don't know. Better go back to penance again, and it's exactly where they want you to be. Now, to run the analogy a little more then, so instead of saying that the ship of baptism sinks, and now you're left with the sacrament of penance to kind of fill the gap and maybe get you on into the, to the heavenly um, con harbor someday, what we would say is, no, the imagery is, if you sin grievously, you've just basically jumped ship. All right, and so then when you repent, what's happening is you're being brought back and put on the ship again. So, because it's always there. And this is why we only baptize one time. And so if a person is baptized as an infant, grows up, and then goes into the wild, crazy time, and then they come back to the church and say, wow, I really fell away. I was dabbling with everything wrong, and now I'm back, and I, I want to get baptized right this time and do it for real. What's the right counsel you give? It was done right the first time. We don't rebaptize. And in fact, God made his claim on you at the font, and he hasn't changed his mind. And the parable of the prodigal son comes to mind here. So when the prodigal son comes back and wants to be just a servant, his dad immediately takes him back because his status had never changed. And this is the way it is with us in Christ. When we're baptized, we are claimed as his. We might walk away from the reality, and what's happening at that point think of this through, is we are denying ourselves the benefit of this gift and we are reducing the wonder of what we should have. We're rejecting the benefit, but the validity still holds even if I don't benefit from it. The validity is still there. It's still a real baptism. And so the moment you say, I think I need to go back and get back to my baptism, I'm going to go find God. You turn around and boom, there he is. He had never left. His claim never goes away. He is always holding on to you. So the imagery of God doesn't let go of you, but you can leap and run away, that's true. But even in your running, he'll, he'll come after you. He doesn't make you find your way back to him. He's there waiting for you. And so when you turn to him in repentance, you're put back on the ship. That's the cool thing. And that's the beautiful thing. And this is why Luther uses the analogy of the castle. So somebody gives you a castle, it's valid and true. But if you don't believe it and don't go live in the castle, you get none of the benefits even though it's yours. It's the same thing with baptism. God has really claimed you, but you don't get any of the benefits. So you have a guy who gets baptized, lapses, and then dies, and you're called upon to do his funeral. And the temptation is to say, this guy was baptized. He's God's child. Well, he was once. And then he wandered off. And so while the baptism is certainly valid, and we are confident of that, we have serious doubts about whether or not he's enjoying the benefits of that. And we need to be honest about that and not play games of putting people into heaven when they don't belong there. All right, good. Anything else there? And you'll have that situation too, guaranteed, um, in your ministry when you're doing funerals for people outside the congregation. People are going to be eager for you to say nice things about them and preach them on into heaven. All right, 269, top of the page, four lines down. <coughs> talking about Zwingli, and I think he's, Pieper is exactly right about this. Zwingli's real and only reason, this is for rejecting baptism, is that he regards the matter as incredible. He is simply opposing the authority of God's word with the Zwinglian ego. The same thing all Reformed, Baal, too, do to this day. Baal exhibits a certain naivete and frankness. He calls attention to the scripture passage which declares that baptism washes away sin, cleanses of sin, and works regeneration, but then he adds, water can't do such great things. He simply opposes the words of Scripture with his own impossible. And this pinpoints, again, Pieper does very nicely here, the problem with the Reformed when it comes to sacraments. It doesn't make sense. And if it doesn't make sense, it can't be so. And they're done. And our rejoinder is, who cares if it makes sense? God has said it. We trust his promise. And that's the end of it for us. All right, good. Uh, let's see. Good. That's good. Um, page 273. This is a long section from Luther, and um, kind of a nice Luther quote here, um, about the last 12 lines, 10 or 12 lines of page 273, down in the footnote. For here the break comes and the disparity begins, that not all receive the same power and benefit of baptism, though they all receive the same baptism. For two kinds of people come to baptism and receive it, some with faith, some without. For this reason, though the baptism is correct in itself and remains holy and divine in the one case as well as the other, for the unbeliever as well as the believer, still this great difference appears among them that the unbeliever cannot enjoy its power and benefit. This is not the fault of baptism, but his own fault, because he does not receive and use, use it as he should. The vessel is not fitted to receive the gift, for the heart is locked. 
so that the power of baptism cannot enter it and work in it, because it, the heart, does not long for and desire that. And we're going to read the same thing in the large catechism here when we get to that in a bit. This is the whole point. So the validity of the sacrament is absolutely there, but the benefit is there only when there is faith to receive it. So faith receives the benefit, but the validity is dependent only upon the promise of God working. So every baptism that is done in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit with the application of water is a valid baptism, but faith has to be there to receive it. All right, good. Nicely said by Luther. This is the distinction between validity and, and benefit. All right, good. Um, then the word sprinkling is fine. <clears throat> no problem there. We already covered that quite well. 275, the use of baptism. What do we do with this? <clears throat> so, two parts to this. And so we already have been stressing this assurance and comfort that come with baptism, that I am claimed by Christ. <clears throat> that's pretty awesome. <clears throat> but there's, that's the exhortation and comfort. But then there's also the other side of this, of the admonition. And so we can also have, so we have the claim by Christ, which means two things. It can mean comfort, okay, consolation, but it can also mean admonition. So how can we use baptism to comfort people? Yeah? Go on. Your sins are forgiven. You have the promises of Christ. You remember. All Christ. right. But I don't feel very Christian today. I don't feel like I'm doing very many good works. Outside of you. Yeah. It's based right. on God's word, not your feelings. Yeah. God has done this. It doesn't matter how you feel about it. It doesn't matter what you think. It doesn't matter what you see in your life. God has done this. This is, this is consoling. This is comforting. All right. Now, how can we use baptism, being claimed by Christ, as an admonition? Yeah. Why are yeah. you acting this way? You're, you've been claimed by God. Act like it. Exactly. <laughs> you, you're, you are baptized. Act like it. And so, well, which one is it? Is it law or gospel? It's both. And it's okay. And see, this is why we have to be a little careful. Some people, you know, well, it's only gospel. That's all it is. But Peter makes it very clear. There is an admonitionary aspect to this as well. You're in Christ. Are you looking like it? Come on. Your behavior doesn't reflect Christian behavior. So act, act your baptism. So it can go both ways. And this is nicely said. Um, this is also true, by the way, um, when we think about God's omnipresence. You know, it kind of plays out there, too. We saw this in Systems 1. So God is present everywhere. sees everything that's going on all the time. He can, you can never get apart from God. Is that comforting or terrifying? Yeah. So it's comforting when you're going through trials and knowing that God's there. Oh, awesome. So good to have God here. But then to think that God's with me all the time, yikes. Why am I doing this if God's with me? And so it can check behavior. And they're both legit. So it's not wrong for the parent to tell the child, now remember, we're going out tonight, and you're here with the babysitter, but Jesus is sitting right here next to you watching everything you do. Whoa, you just made Jesus into the law. That's right. No problem. It's, it's, there's not a problem with that. All right, 276. And let's talk about confirmation a little more. I started harping on it last time. We'll finish harping today. Second full paragraph on 276. We must, be a, we must beware of supplanting baptism with confirmation. There is a trend in our day, also among Lutherans, to exalt confirmation at the expense of baptism. Dr. Walter issues this caution. Pastor must guard against representing confirmation as a complement or supplement of baptism received in infancy as though, for example, the confirmand now for the first time makes the confession and pledge given by his sponsors his own. Rather, the rite of confirmation should primarily serve vividly to recall to the confirmands, as well as to the entire congregation present, the glory of their baptism received in infancy. To invest confirmation with a sacramental character is one of the aberrations so prevalent today, particularly among those who want to be regarded above others as strictly Lutheran and churchly. See the review of an article in Vilmar's Pastoral Theologische Bleiter, which was reprinted in Lehrer und Vera from the Erlanger Zeitschrift. Yeah, check that one out. Um, <coughs> Now, what's this saying? What's Peeper saying here? Yeah, Josh. Well, first you say the problem is people have been saying you need to be baptized and somebody's confessing for you, but it's not really yours until you come out and say it in front of the whole church. And so we basically make confirmation, saying your baptism is not valid until you make it to that point where okay. you make it for yourself. All right. Even using Oop. the term confirmation implies that you're confirming your baptism, which just has all sorts of, as he's pointing out, negative, it does. negative aspects to it. It does. Does 
does this brief paragraph from Walter surprise any of you that this is in paper? It doesn't surprise you? No. Not with the focus of the seminary well, had on, cate on catechism. Okay, well, all right. So based on what you're getting here at the seminary, based on what you think, what you see going on in the parishes and con people's common understanding, do you think this is widely understood? No. I don't think so. I think most of the people in our parishes tend to look con confirmation as a really big deal. Really, really big deal. What's that? Yeah, I would say so. I think for most of them it is a bigger than baptism. You know, baptism is nice, but the kid's just a baby. You know, that's nice. But confirmation, oh, that's cool. Oh, that's important because you're, you know, this is a big deal. What's that? Yeah, you, well, in some parts of the country, you get more than a cake. I mean, man, when I was a kid, confirmation was an enormous deal. It, it rivaled high school graduation. And those were both big deals in the, in the boondocks of Michigan where I was raised. So confirmation parties, these were huge blowouts. I mean, parents went all out. You had the whole congregation basically just going around from party to party on confirmation day. And you got swarmed, you know. Some of you know what I'm talking about. So in your confirmation, you'd rake in the bucks, you know. Seriously, big gifts coming in. That's how it was. And so confirmation's big deal. Well, it's also that people put, oh, oh, I put three years of effort into confirmation. You know, I studied, I memorized. Mm -hmm. I didn't put anything into baptism, right. so what's yeah. the big deal? Yeah. Now, so is, is Peeper right in what he says here? Well, yeah, he is right. So confirmation's not this big deal that we tend to make it. Um, so I have been I'm kind of on a little mini warpath against confirmation for a long time. I'm not crazy about it. In fact, I've said some pretty strong things against it, and I get some pushback. People, when I was confirmed, I took that very seriously. And I stood there in eighth grade in my little gown, and I was, someone was asking me, would you suffer all, even death? And I just saw Polycarp with the arrows in him. <laughs> and I thought of myself there, and it was profoundly moving for me. And so I, I meant it when I said yes. Wow. My goodness, that's awesome. <laughs> now, the question I have, though, is how widespread is that? You know, yeah, it didn't happen to me either. And my, t my biggest fear was I'm going to embarrass myself and not getting a question right, you know, kind of thing. So I don't know that most people get that level. Um, but now, I have since then, I'll grant the possibility that for some people it can be a significant moment in their sanctified life of an unawareness of, wow, this is important. I get that. And if people can maybe look back at that and be reminded of that, it could be helpful. I'm not convinced that for most of our people it functions that way. Um, I'm in the middle of doing some confirmation prep right now, and I've um, been a little less than thrilled with some of the um, things I'm experiencing from some of the people involved. <clears throat> and so I feel like, in fact, I feel a little bit like Luther writing a small catechism's preface. Oh, dear God. What misery I have beheld. <laughs> yeah, I can relate, to, can relate to Martin. You and me, Martin, we're there. Um, so, <coughs> anyway, um, it's, it's distressing, to say the least, what, um, why people get confirmed and what's going on. So, I, I have grave concerns, frankly, about our practice of confirmation, and I encourage you strongly to look hard at what your congregation does and to start teaching and to think about this tough this is truth, guys. Peeper's right here. And this is, this is significant. Our people should be pointed to their baptisms. Confirmation is nothing more than just one more time when the kid says, hey, this is all real for me. It shouldn't be the first time the kid confirms their faith, and it shouldn't be the last. All right? It's just one more stage along the way. And confirmation, of course, has so much more to do about baptism than anything to do with the Lord's Supper. The Lord's Supper has nothing to do with confirmation. And the fact that we confirm and then commune is all messed up. All messed up. I told you this last time. First communion should be yanked out, out of confirmation, parked separate way earlier. And then confirmation happens when a kid is thinking about what this actually means to follow Christ. Maybe I'm ready for this now. Um, there are ways of doing this. In my parish in Michigan, I worked hard at this. And I actually dissociated um, confirmation from the spring graduation ritual. Because, you know, we always tell people it's not graduation, but boy, it sure smells like it when we get all done. And so I came up with a plan and got the congregation on board with it, which was not easy. But we did this. So a kid went through his catechesis. And we had a day school there, so they had pretty extensive catechesis. So when they finished their eighth grade year of catechesis, at that point I said, now, if you're interested in being confirmed, you need to begin your confirmation preparation. 
which means you need to visit a church council meeting, you need to visit a voters meeting, you need to go on an evangelism call with somebody, you need to go on a hospital call with somebody, make a shut-in visit, and you need to write reports about all those things. And then I want you to write a couple of essays, why I want to be confirmed, and what I intend to do with my life and my vocation to serve God. When you have those essays done, have all your reports done, give them to me, your pastor, and then I, your pastor, and your parents will meet together and we'll talk about whether you're ready to be confirmed. And if that conversation goes really well, then you can come meet with the Board of Elders and they'll ask you questions and if they think you're ready, then we'll confirm you and we'll just do it whenever you're ready. So then confirmation was like a baptism. When a kid is ready to be confirmed, his sponsors came up to the font, his parents came up to the font, and the kid stood there and confirmed his faith. No gowns, no flowers. If they wanted to have a party, that was their business, and it happened whenever the kid was done. So I did confirmations year-round, whenever a kid was ready. So if a kid was ready in ninth grade, okay. If he wasn't ready till 11th grade, okay. And it took away some of this onus of, you know, we always tell parents, if your child is not ready for confirmation, then we, we, we can wait. Yeah, what parent is going to say, yeah, Junior's not ready for confirmation. No parent would ever do that to his kid. And so even though we say, what's well, the parent's decision? No, it's not. It's all the peer pressure's decision. So you've got to do something to pull that out of there. And that's why I, I try to get rid of the group nonsense because who's going to isolate his kid from the group? You just don't. So anyway, that was my attempt at it. Um, there's a, a guy in Kansas who's been doing this for a while, and I have this a whole huge file on my, um, in my computer, which I'll send to you if you want. Send me an email and I'll send it back to you. It's the Hosington Confirmation Program. And he had this laid out for three years, memory work and everything, very similar to what I was doing, except he had it even more thought out. And he told me I can share it with anybody who wants it. So send me an email and I'll send it back to you. Oh, should we require the same things for adult uh, converts? I tend to look at it the same way, yeah. What's, what's the difference? Uh, we should expect a lot more catechesis than we do of them. You know, a couple days. Why not? But see, you might, you might accomplish some of that too just by a verbal face-to-face. -face. So with my kids, frankly, I'll be real honest, I was just trying to create some hoops for them. And you're saying, sounds like you're making hoops for them to jump through. That's right, I was. Because I didn't want it to be just pro forma. I wanted them to have to be deliberate about it. They had to put some effort into it. It had to be something they wanted to do. Otherwise, why am I messing with this? And what was really motivating me, frankly, was we'd be confirming these kids, and then five, six years later, they'd be church discipline issues. Because they're not coming to church, they're not caring, they don't, what are we doing? So why are we confirming these kids and they just flip out? Why, why are we doing this? Why are we playing this stupid game? This confirmation is accomplishing nothing. In fact, it's hurting people by giving this false assurance. And there, I got all my church stuff paid up. Give me a break. We're not creating disciples here. We're, we're creating idiots. And it's, it's bad. So that, I, I, so I, say, I, I have... I have very little good to say about confirmation. And you know, you get me going. I just, if you start thinking about it, there's just more and more and more wrong with it. Catechesis, awesome. Confirmation just stinks. All right, Kyle. Yeah, kind of along those same lines, I've heard of pastors even um, saying rather than just having one confirmation, we're going to have these confirmation milestones throughout mm. you know, your life. How do yeah. you? I have no problem with that. I get a little concerned about trying to create new rituals unnecessarily. You know, we've got plenty of cool things the church does already. You know, you know, they're there. But, you know, milestones, we all have them. They tend not to be things that we can necessarily, you know, you can kind of orchestrate some of them, but some of them kind of happen serendipitously. You know, a child goes on a retreat and it becomes a really significant milestone retreat for them. You know, I had some, I told you about when I went to those youth expos when I was a kid, you know, at Concordia College Ann Arbor. Man, those were formative for me. And who could have planned it? It just kind of, there it was. And so, but I don't have a problem with, you know, being deliberate about we're cultivating the faith in this child and the catechesis needs to have these kinds of milestones. And confirmation can be one of those milestones, but it needs to be rethought and carefully redone, in my opinion. Okay, good. Let's fly to the end here. Oh, sorry. Go ahead, Josh. Yeah, fly, fly. No, that's okay. Go ahead. Um, basically, um, what, are, what created all these holdups in the confirmation? Because this isn't a vacuum that all of a sudden we're here. Somewhere in the spectrum of the Lutheran Church, it's... Yeah, there's, it's funny. You know, there's, you can, if you start doing research into the history of confirmation and the practices, you know, there are different things that show up. Um, Sasa was complaining about how this came in from the Jews. It was a Jewish, it was kind of like a Lutheran bar mitzvah. And I've heard that kind of joked about, oh, it's a Lutheran bar mitzvah. There's more truth there than you think. You know, how many cultures have a coming of age kind of party? You know, you know 13, 14, you come of age, you hit puberty, time for your coming of age party. And so you have a bar mitzvah. Or no, we'll have a confirmation. And so it really does be, it starts taking on the rituals of these coming of age events. So there's a lot going on there. It's not a simple thing. Um, and it's, it's a little complicated. But I would argue that there's far more sociological import 
in there than there is theological. You can't make much of a case theologically for confirmation, but you can make a huge case for it sociologically. And that's where it all runs. And you look at most churches, and when you start suggesting change in confirmation, what's the pushback you're going to get? Not one bit of it's going to be theological. Every bit of it's going to be, we've never done that. I have great memories. We had a party. We always do it that way. We had a big blowout for my older kids. Now, my kid, this kid doesn't get that? This isn't fair. Yada, yada, yada. That's all it is. It's just sociological family junk. It's got nothing to do with theology. Nothing. All right, good. Flying on, page 278. Now he's making his case for infant baptism. We hit that hard already last time with Sasa, and Sasa really helped us with that very nicely. But on 278, he reminds us again of just some of the church history, and Tertullian, our friend, comes out again on 278. Besides, from church history, it can be proved that pedo-baptism, which means baptizing peds, babies, um, was commonly practiced in the second century. Tertullian bears witness to its prevalence by his disapproval of it. Exactly. So you got Tertullian who's not happy with it. Tertullian was a bit of a legalist kind of a guy, um, leaning towards Montanism, and he really liked you know, serious Christian faith. So the idea of a baby being baptized without actually knowing what he's doing didn't make much sense to him. But Tertullian, who's in the third century AD, is complaining about this, which only proves that the practice is widespread. You know, so too bad, Tertullian, you don't like it, but it's going on everywhere, so it's, it's happening. And, and Sasa made the case, I think, for us even more strongly last time that this is how it's done. All right, who sh go ahead, Adam. What's that next paragraph about? The next paragraph? Oh, the baptizing, um, are children of Christians who die without baptism saved, or the one after that, the Bell's one? Uh, that one specifically where it says, uh, as certainly he did in the case of girls in the Old Testament. Uh, where am I? Page 278, second. Children of Christians die without baptism. Oh, our children of Christians die without baptism saved. There are some basis for the hope that God is a method, not revealed to us, but she works faith in the children of Christians dying without baptism, as he certainly did in the case of the girls in the OT. All right. Um, yeah. Um, that's, that's, that would be an example of a proof text. Um, so, yeah. What he's talking about is basically they don't have circumcision. And so, there's, so they don't have circumcision. So as a child, a girl who dies, you know, at a year old, there's no circumcision for a, for a child, a girl, is she saved? And he would make the case, well, yeah. Okay, so that's what he's arguing for. So that's what he's after there. He's just he's trying to cover every space, which is one of people's motives here often. Um, for children of unbelievers who don't venture such hope, right? We already did address this last time. I talked to you about the idea of the word coming, right? We talked about that in here, the word present for the unbaptized baby, right? Yep. I thought I did that in here. Okay, good. I didn't want to be behind on that one. All right. Um, we also have uh, just a passing reference here that you don't baptize bells or heretics. Then there's also, but, but then there's that, there's the really weird one though, which people just kind of hits and then leaves it because it's so weird, where you've got Paul talking about being baptized for the dead. You know, that, and that's an exegetical problem. That's Chloe's issue because it's in Corinthians. Um, uh, my, my read on that is that, you need to be, and this is when the Mormons do this, you know, you get, people get baptized for those, for ancestors and stuff. Um, that's not what Paul's talking about. I think, and I would, and Chloe suggests this, and I'm, I'm with him on this, even though you can't be definitive on this because it's kind of murky, but probably to be baptized for the dead is the idea that I'm getting baptized so that I can become part of this faith because I want to see my dead loved ones who have gone before me. And so I'm being baptized in the hope of the resurrection. And the reason I think that's a compelling interpretation is because it comes in 1 Corinthians 15 where Paul's talking about the resurrection. That's his whole point. And he says, otherwise, why are we being baptized for the dead? And his point is, if the dead aren't raised, what's the point? So his point is, people are getting baptized for the dead means, wow, my aunt was part of this church and she was, she's dead now, but she's going to be resurrected. And if I become part of the church and are baptized, I'll see her and I'll be with her again. I want that. And so that might have been a motive in the early church for people actually becoming part of the church. And that, that might be what Paul has in mind there. Is the right. other view like you're being baptized for your relatives who weren't baptized or dead now, or what? Um, see, that's what I, that would be kind of another view. Or the idea that you're getting baptized and your baptism is somehow saving them. And that's problematic. That's what the Mormons would teach. And that, that's hugely problematic. But I don't think that's what Paul's after. But frankly, we don't know really what he meant there because it's a little bit odd. All right. Who can do a baptism? Anybody. It doesn't matter whose hands they are. Can, you, can a pagan doctor baptize a baby? Yes. yes. 
So in other words, if a child is born in stress and there's no one around to baptize this baby and the mother says, please baptize this baby immediately. And the doctor says, okay, fine. How do I do it? Just say, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, put water on the kid three times. Just do it. So the, the doctor does. He only gets water on it one time. Is it a valid baptism? Yes, it is. It is. Now, ordinarily, who should do a baptism? Ordinarily the pastor, but I told you last time, this is not an issue of the validity of baptism. It's purely an issue of the pastoral office, the office of the ministry, which I'm not going to build a case for today. I don't have time. That's a systems four topic, but it's not an issue of the validity of the baptism. This is also why I know it's kind of trendy in some places. Let's let the dads do the baptism. That's so cool. So the pastor stands there and smiles while the father's doing the baptism because it's so much more meaningful when the father does the baptism. Um, it's junk. Don't do that because it's denigrating the office, it's confusing what's going on. He's the father, he has a vocation as father, and to do the actual putting the water on doesn't make him more responsible. That's just kind of sentimental. And so there you have sentiment taking the place of decent theology. Josh. What's the difference between the pagan pastor and the Unitarian, the, the pagan doctor and the Unitarian Because pastor. the pagan doctor is doing it in the context of the faith of those who are present who are trusting this gift, and that's what makes a difference. So it's the confession of the group there. So in other words, this is a baptism of that congregation, even though the congregation can't be present at that time. And that's why the problem with that couple who's part of the Unitarian Church is, we grew up in the church, but this is our church now, so they're not part of any congregation besides that heathen Unitarian one. Okay. Systems for stuff or not, but what about another LCMS pastor coming to that congregation, say as a relative, and huh? say that they want that... Pastor doing no, the baptism. That's not that's not a problem. Even though it's not, yeah, that's not the a pastor problem. of that congregation where yeah, that now involves you're, becoming a member. No, no issue. You're in a congregationalism now, which is also a systems four issue. But um, congregationalism does not wash with me as far at all. And so the pastor Loki is the one who ordinarily would do it, but anybody who's in the office can legitimately do it. And so if the pastor says, Hey, you're the grandfather, why don't you do the baptism? That'd be cool. That's not a problem. If he's in the office, there's no problem there. All right. And if you say there is a problem, then you're kind of hung up on your congregationalism, and that's a Waltharian issue. We'll deal with that later. I hope not to baptize all, all right, that's all. <laughs> oh, no, no problem. All right, we already hit unbaptized babies, covered that. Um, here's the cool thing, um, and what, well, we'll get here in a minute, because well, people, I mean, Luther covers this first pretty well, I think. So baptismal customs, are there customs around it? Yeah, and you have the larger exorcism, the smaller exorcism, you have a cloth being put on, a candle being lit. All that stuff is nice. None of it matters. What matters is water being applied with the promise. That's the important thing. Now, so when a sponsor is there for the sake of the child, is the sponsor somehow, is the sponsor lending their faith so the child can be baptized? No. The sponsor is simply taking responsibility. So that's why Pieper argues the sponsor should be members of that congregation, members of that same confession. They don't have to be members of the same congregation, but the same confession. So, should you have Methodist sponsors for your Lutheran baby? No, that's silly. And in a sense, if you think about it, you're asking a sponsor to be responsible for helping make sure this child grows up in the faith. And why would you put that kind of charge on someone who doesn't even know what the faith is? You don't do that to them. Now, this is a matter of educating. And this is important because you start getting into all this family sentiment and, well, you know, your Aunt Harriet had you for the sponsors and you need to be, you know, it's her turn, you know, you this kind of stuff. You know, had your brother last time, now it's your sister's turn to be the sponsor, but yeah, but she doesn't go to church anymore. Yeah, but it's her turn. Things get all messed up. But we need to be kind of clear on this. Choosing your sponsors is kind of a big deal. Don't do it for family reasons. Choose sponsors who are actually going to be models of Christian faith. who are going to take seriously the responsibility and help nurture the faith in that child. That's what a sponsor does. It's a significant event. So choose somebody carefully. Now, what do you do with your wandered, non going to church sister anymore? Can she come and be present? Sure. And let her be a witness. And it's all cool. So in other words, they can participate. You can even trot them up in front and let them stand there and smile and hold the baby for all I care. They can witness the baptism because what they're saying is, you were baptized. I saw it happen. I witnessed it. But are they taking on any responsibilities for the care of that child's faith? No. They're not sponsors. Now, the beautiful thing is most people who you would be asking to participate as a witness won't know the difference between a witness and a sponsor, so they won't be offended because they don't know any better to be offended. And so you can say, would you come and be a witness for our baptism? Oh, I'm so honored. Great. Come on, I'd be honored. And then you, have, then you have some friends from the congregation who are actually the sponsors 
we're going to take seriously the task of helping raise that child. And the witnesses are there witnessing away, and the sponsors are there taking seriously their responsibility. And I think this is a good word. Now, why not be a sponsor for a pagan or a heathen child or a heterodox child? Because you're making a commitment to raise that child in that person's faith. Why do, don't make that commitment. That's a unionistic kind of a move. You don't do that. You can go and witness it, maybe. Even for like a Methodist? Or Even for like a Methodist. Yeah. Stupid. Yes. In fact, definitely for a Methodist. No. All right. So, are we, does this baby then have like little baby faith that will grow up into real faith someday? No. No. So that baby's faith is the same as the adult's faith. Yes. I'm going to recover this last quarter. Faith is faith is faith is faith. Faith is just a thing that grabs on. And you either have it or you don't. So does the baby have the same faith as the 90-year-old lady? Yes. Same faith as the 50-year-old theologian? Yes. Faith is faith is faith. And we believe it's there. So when does the baptism, when does baptism create faith? Who knows? Somewhere in that whole moment. That's what I was trying to get at last time. You don't need to get hung up on the scenario. And that's what Peter was trying to say. It's there. In the whole event, faith is given and faith receives. And if we can make it all happen and one simultaneously, there it all is, perfect. But we have to do things sequentially. So, and don't get hung up on this. The coolest thing is then, baptism of babies actually screams grace. And when you start getting this stuff straight, there's no better picture of grace coming than a baptism of a baby. And so this is why I love it when the babies cry. You know, like they don't want to be there. Because it's like, I'm going to drag you in the kingdom of God, kicking and screaming, and you're getting baptized, kid. Baptized in the Father, Son, and Spirit. Ha! Gotcha! You know? <laughs> it's awesome. You know, because like, no, I don't want to get baptized. Don't care. You're getting it. And see, that's grace. That's God's work. God calls and grabs us and pulls us, and he makes it happen. And it's beautiful. And this is why it's so cool with a baby we are actually more sure of the grace of, given to a baby than we are to an adult. Because an adult has this thing called his brain that gets in the way. His mind. And he thinks and he wonders and he doubts and he challenges. And that's why we have to educate and catechize first to help bring their brain along. So God always brings the whole person. Think about this. This is significant. It's not a throwaway. I want you to think about this. God always comes to us as we are as the whole person. So if you're an adult, he takes into account how you are. Your brain is an important part of this. And so he brings you along. He talks. He speaks. He teaches. He persuades. He has convincing arguments. And you see yourself making a decision for Jesus when in fact we know the Holy Spirit has done the whole thing, but he brings you along as you are with your mind intact. If you're an infant, he doesn't have that, all that stuff to get in the way. So what does an infant have? Just this need to trust and to be cared for. So God comes and says, here I am. I'm your father who created you. And the baby says, gotcha, dad, and hangs on. And the gift is given, and the faith grabs, and that's it. And it's a beautiful thing. So we can be more certain of a one-week-old's faith than we can of a guy who gets baptized as an adult because God certainly gives the gift. Now, does that mean that the child that is in like Flynn for the rest of his life? No, because faith has to be nurtured, has to be cared for, has to be sustained. So that child needs to be taught God's truth and taken to the Word of God and be present where the Word is preached and be sitting there falling asleep during sermons and hearing the Word proclaimed and growing up in the faith so that child can never think of one time in his entire life when I didn't know Christ was my Savior. And that's the testimony most of you guys have. You know, raised in the church, that's a beautiful thing. Now, don't be embarrassed. I don't remember a moment when I made my decision for Jesus. Isn't that so cool? He decided for me. And I was just raised always knowing this. Certainly there are markers, there are high points, but God just makes the claim and we're sure of it. And that's why I was mentioning a couple guys after class last time. When I go walking through Resurrection Cemetery on occasion, huge Catholic cemetery down by my home, um, there's a section there set aside for all the infants and stillbirths, which is a very sad section. But on the day of resurrection, there's going to be more joy there than a lot of other parts of that cemetery because those children died in the faith because they weren't able to get messed up along the way somewhere. It's kind of cool. All right, good. So that's that, and then I think we're almost to the end here. Um, harder for adult than that. Baptism of John covered that, no big deal. John's baptism was a real baptism of repentance, and so it was actually given grace. Now, in Luther's large catechism, the things to point out here from the Book of Concord, which I had you take a look at real quickly, anything jump out, any questions there? Luther's grounding his argument primarily in the command to baptize all nations and says, hey, 
Are babies part of all nations? Yes. And for him, that's a compelling argument. And so I would say that's a good scriptural argument. I would say, you know, you can, you can talk about whole households, you can go there, and you can make the theological argument, which Luther does not make, but I think is also legit, about what is faith anyway, and what is going on. God is claiming those who are dead, so God can give his faith to whomever he chooses, which is what I would call a kind of a theological argument. But what Luther's arguing for in the large catechism is essentially, babies are also truly believers in God. 